Hello everyone, putting together for you uh, several little short videos uh, just to save on the upload time. I need to break these videos into smaller pieces. So this is your, this is video one for your test number six. All right, and so for this week, make sure um, that you have that beginning material that's in the you know, say from page 1 to 23, 24, you should have those down pat by now. Uh, questions about how many major articles there are in the Constitution, you're going to want to know that. So that's just simply going, reading, outlining, memorizing. You, we, we've had these questions so many times, I, I bet that you have it memorized already. Um, Something I do want to talk about is uh, our constitutional rights are not absolute. We hear things like, I have freedom of speech. I have freedom of religion. Uh, those rights are not absolute. They can be restricted. And so what we need to know, uh, whether we're law enforcement officers or just citizens, what are those restrictions? then that way we'll know when our rights are being violated. So let's say that I uh, want to have a parade. I, there is some social issue that I want to draw attention to. And so I want to have a parade in downtown Sanford. And I go and get my permits, I'm legal, but the city of Sanford can restrict my rights and they can do it in one of three ways. Number one, they can restrict the time that the parade takes place. For instance, I might, because of uh, I want to draw the most attention, I want to have it during the busiest time period. And Sanford can tell me no because that's when traffic would be most impeded and other citizens' rights to be able to drive around the city without worrying about a parade block in traffic is more important than my right for freedom of speech. And so they have to draw a balance. They can't stop the parade from happening, but they can tell me what time I can have this parade. So I doubt very seriously that Sanford is going to shut down Horner Boulevard at 12 noon at lunchtime so that I can have a parade for some social issue that I'm interested in. Another thing that the government can do is tell me where I, <coughs> excuse me, where I can have this parade. So that's place. They can tell me the place. Notice they're not stopping my speech or the ability to have this parade, but they're telling me what time I can do it and they're telling me where I can do it. So they may just tell me outright, you can never have it on Horner Boulevard. That'll block too much traffic, but we can get you two blocks to the north of that. So they can restrict time, place. And the third thing they can do is manner. They can tell me how I can do this parade. Uh, for instance, the length of it. You know, how many marchers can I have? Uh, they can restrict my ability uh, to communicate with signs that might have hate speech in it. So they can control the manner in which I do things. So notice in all three instances, they're not stopping my speech. However, there are limitations, and those are time, place, and manner. So we can do the same thing with any of the, the constitutional rights. Let's say that I work for CNN and I'm a news reporter and I want to cover the war. We're attacking some island in the Caribbean and I want to be there to film it. The government, the federal government can tell CNN, 
the time that we can film, the place we can film, and the manner of the storytelling that we're doing. So here's a real life example. Uh, 20 years or so, we had some college students that were taken hostage in Grenada. And we were about, we mean in the United States, we were about to go and get our students back. And the 82nd Airborne were loading up and the Marine Corps out of uh, Jacksonville uh, were loading up and CNN learned of this and what they wanted to do was be on the because the Marines were going to do an amphibious assault they were going to land on those beaches at Grenada Island and they wanted to be there uh, during the night because that's when we do most of our battle planning we have good night vision weaponry so we were going to attack during the night CNN wanted to be on the beach and light those beaches up with uh, cameras and camera lights and so literally the enemy would be able to see our Marines coming ashore and be lit up like target practice and the federal government can say yes you have the freedom of the press but we're going to restrict the time that you do it the place that you do it and how you do it and so they weren't allowed to light up our marines uh, as they were coming onto the beach and the same thing uh, applied at the airport the 82nd airborne were jumped into that airport paratroopers did cnn knew it was going to happen and they were told you cannot light up this airport while our soldiers are jumping in all right so i hope you get the idea we do have constitutional rights but they're not absolute uh, we can restrict time place and manner oh let's see we've also just simple memory work from the previous test uh, what are the first 10 amendments called you should know that by now and uh, just if you don't make sure you know it for this upcoming test you want to make sure that you know what speeches are not protected like uh, communi communicating threats or overthrowing the government or hate speech make sure that you understand what uh, types of speech are not protected and what the definitions of them are because there's some some things that sound very similar you're going to want to know the difference between incendiary speech and communicating threats or hate speech make sure you have those definitions down pat all right what are the different types of laws uh, and towards the beginning of that lesson plan, you've learned about uh, statutory law, common law. Make sure you can work those things inside and out, that you know which ones are written down, which ones are judge-made law, um, which ones relate to criminal law versus civil law. Um, you're going to really need to know the different types of law which ones are created by judges which ones are created by legislatures make sure you look those up if you haven't already make sure you understand what's in the first amendment what's in the fourth amendment and again these are things we've covered for six or seven weeks now so hopefully you've got this down pat which of the articles uh, for instance, have the supremacy clause. Which article has that? And what's in Article 1? What's in Article 2? What's in Article 3? Again, things we've been doing our entire time together. So hopefully you have that down pat by now. All right, what does the free exercise clause do? What does that mean? Which amendment is that? attached to the free exercise clause and then also realize that that's not an absolute right either that the government can put limitations on 
our free expression and our free exercise, for instance, of religion. We can't play with snakes in church. We can't drink poison in church. Uh, those are just two examples that, uh, or smoke peyote, uh, because that, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And so the federal government, through the expression or free exercise of religion, that's not an absolute right. And the government can put limitations on it. All right. Uh, what type of trial, or I guess a, a better way to word this is what type of a charge requires a jury trial? Is it felonies, misdemeanors, infractions, civil uh, infractions. So what types of crimes require a jury trial? Because that's a constitutional right to be tried by a jury of our peers. But that's not an absolute right either. So when does it apply? Make sure you find that answer. All right. On definitions now, Make sure you understand things like habeas corpus. What does that mean? How does it apply? How about bills of attainder? So towards the beginning of the lesson plan, you had a series of these, these uh, definitions. Uh, ex post facto laws. Make sure that you feel comfortable with those different definitions. All right, now some simple ones. Things like, what is the basic law of the land? Again, it's, just, it's word for word in your lesson plan. Make sure that you find that. Make sure you feel comfortable with the different amendments. I've told you already, like the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth and the Sixth Amendments. And what they do now if you move on through your lesson plan a little bit uh, the next sort of big heading is make sure you understand the differences in jurisdictions for instance what is territorial jurisdiction what is subject matter jurisdiction so a territory defines where a law enforcement officer can enforce the law and the subject matter defines what the material is that the officer can enforce. Right? So the geographical area where the officer can take action, you're going to say that's territorial jurisdiction. Or the crimes that the officer can enforce, you would say that's subject matter jurisdiction. Um, in a related matter to jurisdiction, we come into hot pursuit. And uh, that's an exciting topic. People always have lots of questions about hot pursuit. Um, but the, the bulk of it, it's not really complicated. Basically, the crime has to occur in the officer's jurisdiction. And if it's, uh, uh, now look, all of this can be curtailed by the department's policy. They might have a zero chase policy. You can never chase anybody at any time and then hot pursuit wouldn't apply. But for the sake of this discussion, let's assume we are allowed to pursue someone. And so you're gonna be, uh, or need to know, well, where can the officer go? Let's say we're a Lee County or a Hornet County deputy Chatham County deputy and a crime occurs in our presence and uh, we, we're trying to pull a car over and they won't stop. Well, where can we go? If we get to the county line, do we have to stop? Does it make a difference if it's a misdemeanor, an infraction, or a felony? You're going to want to look that up, all right? But the, the short of it is as long as it's what we call a steady and a continuous pursuit, 
the officer for basically any crime can pursue anywhere in North Carolina. Now, that's going to change. Let's say we chase them towards South Carolina, and now we hit the South Carolina line. You're going to want to make sure that you understand when, if ever, can you just keep on going right on down into South Carolina. Can you do it for an infraction, for a misdemeanor, for a felony? So look those things up. Uh, the one little caveat that I want to, to bring, well, two, two caveats I want to bring out. One, the pursuit needs to be steady and continuous. If you have to stop for any reason, you don't get to jump back into the chase. So for instance, let's say you're about to run out of gas. And so now you have to stop and get gas. You're out of it. It's turn around and go get your gas, turn around and go home. The other thing that used to be in play but is not now. Uh, back in the day, you had to keep eyesight on the suspect. So if they went around a curve or over a hill and you lost sight of them, we used to have to just turn around and go home. But now you don't have to. You can stay in the chase as long as you remain in it steady and continuous. All right, so what to pull from it? Make sure you understand from the lesson plan. When is the jurisdiction only applied to North Carolina? You can go anywhere in North Carolina. Or when does it apply where you can go into other states? And then what states are we allowed to go into. So that's all in your lesson plan. Make sure you read it, outline it, understand it. All right. Make sure you, and, and I covered this in last week's video, so I don't want to cover old ground again, but I do want to bring to your attention, you need to know the difference between being detained and being arrested. They are not the same. And so the burden on the officer to provide proof is different. To detain someone, it doesn't take as much proof. It only takes a reasonable suspicion that you can articulate in court the reason why you detained someone. Versus when someone is seized, they're under arrest. That requires probable cause. That's a much higher level of suspicion. All right, so make sure you understand the difference between being detained or seized. Now, some interactions with law enforcement require no suspicion at all. An officer can just walk up and start talking to a person and that requires no suspicion. And those are called voluntary encounters. So maybe the officer is working off-duty security at the mall. And the officer's just walking around and, and being friendly like a community police officer should and, and just say, hey, how are you doing today? How's your shopping going? Are you ready for Christmas? You can interact with a person like that all day long and it requires no suspicion whatsoever. But if the person tries to walk away and end that conversation and the officer stops them, notice the officer hasn't arrested them for anything, but the officer's not allowing them to leave. Now that requires a level of suspicion because now the officer is detaining that person. And that requires reasonable suspicion. You don't have to be certain they've committed a crime. You don't even have to be 50% sure they committed a crime. You just need to be able to articulate why in that moment you didn't allow them to leave. Maybe one of the store managers has called in a shoplifter and gave a description of the person and here is someone you're interacting with that fits that description. 
You don't know that it's the shoplifter. You just know they fit a description and so does five other or 500 other people in the store right then or in the mall. But the law does allow you to detain and to question to find out or help find out, is this the person? Now, if you decide, yes, this is the person, now you're moving from being detained to place it, to seizing them, placing them under arrest. And again, you don't have to be sure you have the right person. You just have to be more sure than not. And, and basically the law, the way the Supreme Court worded it is, it's more probable than not you've got the right person. Now, if you stop for a moment and think about that, that's just a little bit more than a coin toss. It's more probable than not. That's like 50.00001%. You don't have to be sure. You just have to be more certain than not you've got the right person. Then you can place them under arrest. So there you can see how it went from voluntary encounter to a detainment to a seizure. And as we climb up that thermometer, it requires more and more suspicion. So make sure what level of suspicion, if any, do you have to have for a voluntary encounter? What level of suspicion do you have to have to detain someone? And what level of suspicion do you have to have to arrest someone? All right, if any of our actions while we're detaining someone, if someone challenges that in court, maybe they're going to want to argue it's an unlawful arrest. And we could be in civil court getting sued for the actions we took. What test is the court going to look at to determine the, if the things we did were they legal? And we covered some of this last week when we talked about the officer's use of force. It's the exact same test. Anytime an officer's actions are being measured, whether it's using force, if it's arresting or detaining, the test is always totality of the circumstances. The court is going to look at the big picture, the whole story and determine from all the facts, and that's the totality aspect of it, if the, if the officer acted in a legal manner. So anytime law enforcement is tested, it's all its totality of the circumstances. All right. Now, there's other things to worry about when we have someone in a voluntary encounter, if we have someone detained, or if we have someone seized. And one of the issues is this. What if I want to move that person, physically move them? For instance, let's say we're on the side of the road. It's a busy traffic time, and I get the person out uh, to do a roadside sobriety test. I, I think they're intoxicated and I want to get them to do the finger to nose and the heel the toe walk down the line. Well, traffic is going everywhere. Is there, can I move that person? And here's what we need to be careful of. In a voluntary encounter, which is not what's happening here, but in any in a voluntary encounter, we do not move a person because the instant that we do move them, it has ceased to be a voluntary encounter, right? I, I move them from point A to point B. Don't need to be doing that if I'm trying to claim, no, 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 this was voluntary. Now let's go to this story on the side of the road. For most, I mean 95% of the time, when you have someone detained, you don't have a right to move them. 
And we have to be very careful before touching or moving someone because they're not under arrest. They're just detained. And so what a defendant can claim is if they're just detained and I move them, and folks, the law, some court cases have said if I move them a shorter span as one foot and I have just kidnapped them. And kidnapping is a felony. And in North Carolina, if an officer is convicted of a felony, he or she loses their ability to enforce the law for life. You lose your certification, you're not eligible to get it back. So we need to know what we're doing before we start moving people around. So you may have seen cases where maybe someone fits a description and we, let's say they were involved in a robbery, an armed robbery. And now we want the store clerk to look at this person. We've pulled the car over. We think we have the suspect. And we want right then for the store clerk to say, yes, that's him or no, it's not. Notice we haven't made an arrest because we don't know if we have the right person yet. They fit the description, but so does 500 other people. What I'm saying to you is we do not move the suspect and take them back to the store or the bank or wherever this happened to let that clerk say, yes, that's him or no, that's not him. We do not move people that we are detaining. So instead, we will bring the store clerk to wherever we have this person stopped. And we'll let the, we'll just drive, another officer will drive by, let this person get a look and tell us, yes, that's him. No, that's not him. Now, there, all of these rules that we're learning, they're called black letter law. But law has exceptions. And, and so most laws do. And this is one of those cases if we go back to my original story, we're trying to do roadside sobriety tests and traffic is really bad. The law does allow me for the safety of the suspect to move them just far enough to get them in a safe place to conduct my sobriety test. So if there's a guardrail right there next to the car, I can ask them to step over that guardrail. That will protect the suspect and myself why we do these sobriety tests. So what's the takeaway? For 95% of the interactions with the community, we do not move anyone for a voluntary encounter. We do not move anyone while they're just being detained. The only time we will move someone is when they have become in our custody meaning we have seized them and placed them under arrest. When that happens, we're further up the thermometer. We're at probable cause. We make the arrest. We can then move the prisoner. You already know what's the legal standard for making an arrest <laughs> probable cause. The legal standard to detain reasonable suspicion. The legal standard for the voluntary encounter, you don't need any suspicion at all. You can just walk up and start talking. All right, let's move further into the lesson plan. I believe we mentioned last week that North Carolina does not have, even though you may have seen it on uh, the Andy Griffith show, there's no such a thing in North Carolina as citizen's arrest. But a citizen can detain someone, meaning keep a person there until law enforcement arrives. But there's just certain instances when a citizen can do that. For instance, if there's the potential harm to life, a citizen can interact. If there's a fist fight going on, the citizen can break the fight up. Because someone could get seriously hurt, right? Oh, a citizen can get involved to stop a felony. 
A citizen can get involved to stop the theft of property. So make sure in that lesson plan, you understand when can a citizen get involved. Something in a related matter, and it's right there in the same sort of section of your lesson plan. What happens if you're driving by uh, uh, and you see an officer that needs help? And you get out of your car and walk over there, and the officer looks at you and says, Help me. <laughs> when you are requested by law enforcement to assist, what rights and duties do you have as the citizen? For instance, can you look at the officer? Maybe they're just getting beat up and they say, help me. Do you have to get involved? Or can you say, good luck, hoss. You're on your own. And if the officer were to survive that encounter, could the officer charge you for anything? But what if you do decide, yes, I'm going to help this officer, then what rights do you have? So here's the short of it. None of us has a duty, even when requested, to help law enforcement. They can be sitting there fixing to die, and you have no duty to help them. I will give you one little caveat. If you were, say, involved in a wreck, where it was your fault and because of your wreck it hurt the law enforcement officer then yes you have a duty to assist but other than that you don't have to help but if you do help once you do it's like you just got deputized you have just become a sworn law enforcement officer and you have at that point, the legal right to arrest. Notice in, in the first question, I said, when can a citizen arrest? And they can't. But when that the officer sort of blesses you by saying, help me, you've just become a law enforcement officer. You're not a citizen anymore. And so you have the right to arrest someone. You can take a person into custody. You can detain. You can use force. If you get injured while doing this, you're covered by workers' comp at the department. It's just like you became an officer. So make sure you read and understand that section thoroughly about what rights and duties you have if requested by an officer to help. All right, let's turn our attention now to the search warrant and arrest warrants. Um, let's do uh, arrest warrants first. And one of the most common misconceptions that, that the average citizen has is that the warrant has to name the suspect. And that's just not true. There's many times we're looking for people and we don't know their name. All we have sometimes are just descriptions. If we're fortunate, we might get a street name. The best story I have for this is one time I was assisting an officer that had been shot. And one of the citizens, while we were investigating this, one of the citizens said, Tiger shot him. And I'm like, well, what's Tiger's real name? And no one knew. He was in a gang and they only knew him as Tiger. <clears throat> they were able to give me a description. And so my warrant said there'll be a place for names, but there's also a place for aliases. And that's where I put Tiger and then the description. And that's fine. I do not need to know the person's real name. So when I see y'all make a mistake on a test question about arrest warrants, that's usually going to be it. So don't let that happen to you. We don't need to know the person's real name. <clears throat> okay. 
when, and this is super important, when can an officer arrest for misdemeanor crimes that did not occur in his or her presence? Now what that means is the officer did not see it happen, but it's a, fe- um, a misdemeanor. An officer can't arrest for something he or she did not see if it's a misdemeanor. If it's a felony, fine. The officer can arrest. Didn't have to see it happen. But misdemeanors, for the most part, the officer is going to have to get someone who did see the crime to go down to the clerk's office and get the arrest warrant. And once the warrant is taken out, Now the officer can take that and serve that piece of paper. But remember, that's just the black letter law. There's always exceptions to these laws. And this one has several. You're going to want to make sure you know what those exceptions are. So let me throw one out there to you. What if you're an officer and you get called to Walmart and... uh, Uh, Walmart security tells you they just saw this man that they're detaining shoplift. And they've, they've searched this person and found the items on their body. This person did shoplift. That's a misdemeanor. And you didn't see it happen. Can you arrest this person? And so if you read your lesson plan, you're going to see one of the exceptions to the rule is you can arrest for misdemeanors when it involves shoplifting. Some others are um, most of the domestic situations now. If you back up to my day uh, when I was acting as a law enforcement officer, if I didn't see domestic violence happen right there in front of me, I couldn't arrest for it. I could ask the, the, let's assume that the lady was the victim. I would have to ask her, can I give you a ride to the clerk's office? You take out this warrant for me and I'll come back and serve an arrest. I'll arrest that man. You don't have to do that now. Now the law allows, even though it's a misdemeanor that, that occurred outside of the officer's presence, if the officer sees evidence that this thing has really happened, He can arrest without the warrant. All right, so make sure you get into the lesson plan and look at the, first know the black letter law. An officer cannot arrest for a misdemeanor crime outside of his or her presence. But then make sure you understand all of the exceptions. So you're going to tell me things like domestic violence, shoplifting, for any felony. There's about five to eight of them listed there. Make sure you know what they are. All right, once we make an arrest, we've got to do some things. We have to do them. And so we need to know, well, let me present it to you this way. First, let's talk about what they are, and then there's a little temporary exception to it. The black letter law says that upon making an arrest, the officer must identify him or herself as a law enforcement officer. So number one, hey, I'm a cop. Number two, you have to tell the person you are under arrest. And number three, you have to tell them what for. All right, so there's the three things we have to do. Now, here's a small, it's a temporary exception that happens sometimes. What if we're trying to affect that arrest and we're, you know, we're saying the magic words and all of a sudden the suspect reaches up and punches us square in the mouth, takes off running. I don't have to, while I'm chasing them, say I'm a law enforcement officer. I don't have to say you are under arrest. I don't have to tell them why. The law allows me to affect my arrest, meaning get this person in custody, get the situation under control first, and then I can start jumping through those three hoops that we talked about. 
All right, identify self, <clears throat> tell them they're under arrest and why, what's the nature of the charges. All right, there are some papers 